before I uh, read the scripture this morning, I just want to echo in part what Steve said in prayer uh, earlier, that thanks go out, but our hearts and our prayers, if, if you've lost a father or mother, um, husband or wife, brother or sister, or son or daughter serving our country, uh, we're with you. God's with you, and you're not alone. The reading this morning comes in part from Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from the message. Now, Jesus went back to teaching by the sea, and he said, Listen, what do you make of this? A farmer planted seed, and as he scattered the seed, some fell on the road, and the birds ate it. Some fell on the gravel, and it sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. And some fell in the weeds, and as it came up, it was strangled among the weed, and nothing came of it. But some fell on good earth and came up with a flourish, producing a harvest, exceeding his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? This morning, we're going to be talking through the rich metaphor of agriculture, as you have just heard. Seeds and soil, Mark chapter 4. And this past week, as I was pondering Mark chapter 4, and also I was looking out in my backyard, and I have a maple tree that produces these. How many of you have these in your backyard, right? The seeds. We affectionately call them whirly twirlies. Some people call them helicopters. Whatever you may call them, they're very nice and they're fun to watch. And uh, we have a tree in the backyard. You can't get your arms around it. It's probably 60, 70 years old. It's probably 50 or 60 feet high. It is a sprawling maple tree. And it has probably tens of thousands. I don't know how many are on the tree. But this past week, I was just watching them fall. And they go into all of the interesting places, don't they? I have them just in my grass. I have little maple trees that are trying to pop up. I have them in the cracks of the sidewalk in the front yard. Uh, they're, they're trying to grow. I have them trying to gr grow in my gutters. I have them, uh, they fall everywhere, underneath the swing set, in the garden, wherever it is. My neighbor's yard, he loves them too. Wherever they go, and especially on a week like this where the wind is blowing, uh, they just go wherever. And the truth of it is, wherever these go, there are not many of them that will end up being big, sprawling maple trees. Very few of them will. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying in the parable that he's going to talk about this morning of seeds and soil. The seeds are going to be cast out, and very few of them actually make it to producing something. What does this parable mean? What is, the, what is behind it? What is really he trying to communicate? That's where we're going to be this morning, is trying to figure out exactly what this means. And for those who heard the parable that day, it was just a story about seeds and soil and a, a bird here or there. What, what does it mean? And what you have to realize is that if you hear a parable, you are going to have to dig and figure out what is the meaning. You're going to have to go below the surface and see exactly what is there. It's going to take some work. And so that's what we're going to do this morning is figure out what is this message that was so powerful in its original context which still has power for us today to communicate something significant. Um, and so I'm glad you're here this morning. We've been here to examine the book of Mark. We've been walking through this book, and now we're in chapter 4. And as you know, we're trying to gain a greater understanding of who is the king, the king in disguise. And here are some of the things he has said so far. He has said things like this, repent and believe. He said, come and follow me. Be clean. Your sins are forgiven. Rise and pick up your mat. This is my family, the ones who do the will of my Father. He's been saying some very interesting things. Who is this teacher, Jesus Christ, the Son of God? 
And so for this morning, we're going to be in chapter 4, reading, studying, examining, pondering, what is Jesus trying to communicate through this parable? And so the setting, uh, as John told us, was right by the Sea of Galilee in a boat. The crowds are pressing in so tightly, he has no room to really move. And so he retreats onto a boat and goes out. Where is this on the Sea of Galilee? Well, experts try to pinpoint a place. And this is one of the places they think, they call it the Bay of Parables. You could probably envision that, right? The crowd is impressing in. And so now he gets in a boat, he goes out, you know, 10, 20, 30 yards. And now he's speaking to the people on the hillside as his voice carries across the water. He has something significant he wants to teach. Maybe this is the place, maybe not. But the words really that come out of his mouth are the things that really are more important. And he doesn't just teach as a rabbi would teach in very didactic learning settings. And No, he, he retreats to a setting outdoors and he teaches through a parable. Now, we all know a parable is a simple story. It's really trying to teach a very significant truth. And a lot of times they use earthly things that people are very familiar with, like seeds and soil and farmers, to, to communicate something very significant at a deeper level. And so as a listener, you had to dig. You had to figure it out. What was he trying to communicate? And so being on the outside is a hard place to be, right? Because some people got what the parable meant, and some people did not. And being on the in outside is hard, even with very simple things. I don't know about you. In our family, we like to get the popsicles that have the, the little uh, riddles on them. Let me read you one. What did Polly the parrot want on the 4th of July? Now, if you are thinking to yourself, I have no idea, you're on the outside, probably want to get on the inside. The answer is a firecracker. You guys are good here. These guys right here in the front row, they're all over there. You guys must see a lot of popsicles. Yeah. But that's the point of being on the inside or outside. And it, around our table, if we can't think of it, we're always wanting to know what the answer was. And the same is true here. Jesus is trying to say there are outsiders and there are insiders to understanding parables. And the thing is, you have to be able to break the code to inquire of the meaning to really find out. And so, in the next part of Mark, he goes to verse 10. And so if you have your Bible, that's where we're going to pick up the story. You have just heard the parable, and now verse 10. A little bit later, it says this, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. Probably a lot of questions like, what did the parable mean? Why do you speak in parables? And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Huh. Why do you speak in parables? Why? Verse 11, he says this, that some have been given the secret of the kingdom of God. And he says, quickly, right there, he says, there are some who are on the outside and some who are on the inside. And to be an insider, notice how you become that. You are given. He uses the word. You are given access. Who gives you access? The Father gives you access. He gives you understanding and insight divine consent. He is the giver of this. It's not by human try to figure it out knowledge. Understanding the parable is given by God. And what Mark has done, he's kept this tension that we have seen so far that there's this thing called the divine sovereignty and then there's human free will. And how do you weigh both of those? Which one is it? And Mark wants to just keep putting it out there to say, it's a juxtaposition. It's, it's something that you have to live with this tension. 
people have been writing tomes trying to figure it out. Which is it? Did he choose us? Did, did, we, choo did we choose him? What is it? And Mark is saying, there it is. Some are going to be on the inside and some are going to be on the outside. And the one who controls that is the Father who gives them access. He is the one who is in control. And, and we can tell we are in the deep end of the pool when we start asking those kinds of questions. And that's where Mark wants to leave us there. He says, yes, understand that. The Father, how will we understand it all? We can't. But we walk forward and we trust him. We live with this tension. And the good news for us as readers of the parable is that we are like there on the, the front. We get to be there with the disciples and those who are asking the questions, what did it mean? We get to see what it means. We're given access. We're like given a private tutorial right there with Jesus. And so the rest of our time we're going to spend in this parable, what did it mean? What, what's it mean for us? And so in verse 14, we read, it's a very simple verse. Jesus is now explaining to them, the sower sows the word. So he wants to start telling and explaining from the vantage point of the farmer, the sower. And it's nice because the sower, he is probably someone who wore a satchel and with seed, and he would walk out into the field and he would just throw the seed it was very lavish. It was very generous. Notice that he doesn't just pick and choose. I'm going to put a seed here, and I'm going to put a seed there. He, he takes it, and he throws it out, and it, he lets the seed go wherever it's going to go. But it's not, he's, Jesus says, it's not, I'm not talking about seed here. He's like, in the parable, you hear the word seed. What I'm really talking about is the word. The word goes out. And it's a Greek word that's a very broad term. It's called the logos. The logos goes out. And so it goes out, and it talks about written scriptures, the written logos. That's part of it, the Old Testament. Are you hearing the, the word? But that word is also used to talk about Jesus himself in the book of John. In the beginning was the word. It, the, it's the same word, the logos. And so logos is this, is this huge word that talks about truth, the kingdom of God in written form, in relationship. And so he says this farmer goes out and he sows the seed, the word that goes out. And from this point, he now switches and he goes into the next verse because he now wants to tell you about that word that goes out it goes in lots of places. Lots of places. Now he's going to be making some application of where those places are. And so, much like the maple tree, the whirly twirlies whirl out. And the first place is in verse 15. Let's see what he says. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, where they hear... Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And so the, the word is, is sown out there, and you know what? In the first place it falls? On the path. Hard place. Difficult place for a seed to grow, right? So difficult that there's lots of traffic. People are walking. Animals were walking there. Carts. Could get crushed. But also, if you notice in the parable, what comes down to take the seed? Birds. Birds are there. And what Jesus is saying is that when the seed goes out and it falls into a very hard place, he's now talking about people. And he's talking about hard-heartedness. And when the logos goes out and falls wherever it may, sometimes it falls onto the path. And the people's lives are very, very hard it's very difficult to hear. It doesn't penetrate. In our house, or next, outside of our house, we have a patch where we like to grow strawberries. We love strawberries, you know. You don't, low maintenance, right? The strawberries grow. You pick them and eat them, and you're right there eating them. Great. 
And we've noticed that over the past couple summers, we've been having some, some competitors eating our strawberries. You know, you get the strawberries, you look at them, you're like, you know what, I think we should probably give those another day or two. And the chipmunks are probably like, oh, that's good for us, right? And so they go out there, beat us to them. And it's much like a strawberry that sits there or a seed that's on the path. It's very vulnerable. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. When you th throw out the seed and it lands on the path and the hard-heartedness just wants to leave it there and doesn't really care much about it, there is an enemy that comes and swipes that. It's very vulnerable. It's not protected by the soil, nothing. It just sits there waiting to be taken. And what Jesus is saying is that you don't realize it, but when the word goes out and lands in the lives of people, there is a battle that takes place. Know this. Ephesians speaks of this battle. It's not about flesh and blood, but it's about invisible principalities and the enemy of darkness. And there is nothing better than he wants than to allow you to not have the word penetrate your life at all and to come by and take it from you and to rob that word, the logos. It's exactly what he wants to see happen. And many do. And the word goes out and people are like, I don't need to hear that. And my, I get this visual picture of the birds that you have at the beach, right? That are just sitting there waiting. And, and when any drop of food goes out, there they are. And there's a spiritual correlation there as well. Is when the logos goes out to hard-heartedness, the birds come down and they feast and they take it. And that seed that had the potential of growing into a gigantic, sprawling maple tree never has a chance. It's gone. It's not there anymore. And so Jesus would say, is your heart like that? Is your heart like the hard path? If it is, be warned. The Logos will never do anything for you. Well, there's another soil type. Verse 16. Let's read this one together. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. And when they have no root in themselves, but they endure for a little while, then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. The rocky ground. In this area, geographically, there was a couple inches of soil that was good, but then right below it was these, this, this uh, limestone that was impenetrable. And so to plant something significant, you had to break through that and get rid of the stone the limestone. And so the next seed, it goes out, and it whirls out there, and it falls in this rocky ground. And at least the, the birds aren't going to come and get it. Now the soil is sown over, and, and now there's a chance for it to grow. And it does, and it looks great in the rocky soil. I mean, something sprouts up. It looks beautiful. Something is growing. But there's a problem. There's no root. It can't break through the limestone, so there's, there's no root system. It just grows and exists. A couple of years ago, I was raking up some grass clippings in my lawn, and the next thing I know, I am like raking my lawn off the earth. And I'm like, this isn't good, right? Patches of grass are just kind of being taken off. And so my neighbor kind of saw this, and I was kind of looking worried. And so he comes over, and he said, I see what the problem is. And I said, what? He's like, you got grubs. I'm like, oh, great. What's that? What do I need to do? Well, essentially, the grubs come, and they eat the root system of your grass. They feast on it, and it dies, and you can just kind of peel it off. And that's what was happening. It's the same thing what Jesus is saying here. He said, when the seed goes down, and it lands in the rocky place— it looks great for a little bit, but there's no root system there. There's nothing there. And so it sprouts up, but then look what happens. The sun comes, and it scorches it. And if you have no root system, no way to draw water, you are just scorched, and it withers, and it fades. And so what Jesus is saying is that there is 
something significant about the rocky soil to hear, to hear from it. And the warning is, are we hearing things from the Logos that are just good and convenient? You see, I like that, and so I'll listen to it, and it sounds good, but it's nothing too hard. It's quick. It's easy. I can just do it, and it doesn't really inconvenience me that much. And, and so we have the Logos planted, we think, in our lives— but when, as it says, but when tribulation, persecution arises on account of the Logos, then what happens? You see, Jesus says, if you take my word and actually plant it into your life, he says what? People are going to hate you because of me, because of the Logos. They're going to hate you. In the book of James, it says, consider it pure joy, not if you come into hard and troubling times. It's like when you do. And so those times are going to come. And Jesus is saying, where is your root system? You see, if you're just in the rocky soil and it's quick and easy words and sounds good now and that's all I need, the sun is going to come and will scorch you. And at the end, what will you have? You have nothing. And so the seed that had that potential to grow into this sprawling maple tree dead. There's nothing there. Two soil types, hard and rocky, but there's another one that's coming. Let's read it in verse 18. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear, again, we're always hearing it, hearing the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. It's interesting. As we keep reading, we keep getting this, this idea that there's more hope to come. And unlike the other two, the seed, this time it goes out, and the bird's not going to get it, the sun isn't going to scorch it. It actually falls into a very lush place. It's great. Into the garden, there's soil that covers it, and the right nutrients are there, and it is ready to grow and to sprout into something that is great and beautiful. But there's also some other things that are growing in the garden as well. Did you see that? There are competitors thorns, thistles, weeds that are also in the same plot that are now growing together. And now there's competition in the garden plot. Competition for water, sunlight, competition for space. And as these two things grow together, there's problems that lie ahead because the weed and the thorn and the thistle that grows has the potential to choke. Do you see that? It has the potential to choke out and kill the Logos. And what Jesus is saying is that it, you cannot have a garden plot where you have competition going on. What is the competition? Well, Jesus, I mean, he's... He explains that part too. He says this, there's three things that grow in competition that can choke the word. The first one is the worries of this world. What are the things the world is worried about? Status, money, making it. I mean, we could go on and on. The, the worries of the world, the things that it cares about, grow in this spot too, if, you, if they are planted and allowed to grow. The next is the, the deceitfulness of riches. Not that riches are bad, but riches have the potential to being worshipped. Remember, Jesus would say you cannot serve two masters, right? You can't have the master of money and the logos growing together and think that it's going to work out well. It's not. One will get choked out. And then the third thing, it's kind of a catch-all. He said, the desire for whatever, the desire for other things, whatever ends up in your garden plot that you give attention to, that you give energy to, that you give time to, if you want to keep fostering and growing that 
and think that that's okay to grow that on the side with the logos, you're fooling yourself. The logos can have no competition. It needs time. It needs its own space. As I was talking with someone this week, they said, we need to be the kinds of people who are able to go and to yank out those thorns and thistles and those weeds. Just yesterday, I was looking at around my house, and I have uh, some weeds that are growing that are those really prickly ones. And so I was ready to go in and grab it, and I was like, no, I'm not going to. <laughs> I didn't have any gloves with me. I didn't have a shovel or anything. I was like, mm, no. And I left it there. It's fine for now, right? It's going to keep growing and growing, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying. He said, if you keep the competition there with the logos, guess what will happen? There's something that will be choked out. It'll prove unfruitful. Unfruitful. A great question to be asking, and this isn't the right venue to do it, but if you're in a life group, is what are those things that we allow to grow in competition with the logos? Great question. Think about that. And you go down the list of worries of this world, deceitfulness of riches and desires. What are those things that we hold in competition in the garden plots of our lives and our hearts? There's a fourth kind. Verse 20, it says this. <clears throat> but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. A number of years ago, I was planting some bushes around my house, and uh, I'd torn all the old ones out, and I wanted to put some new ones in. So one of the ladies here in the office said, you know what you need to do before you plant those? I was like, what? You need to put some manure in to the garden bed. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. She's like, trust me. So I, with my truck, I drove out to her friend's farm, picked up the dry horse manure. Not the wet horse manure, the dry horse manure. <laughs> I didn't know there was a difference until I got there, but th there is. <laughs> Took it back, threw it into the garden plots where I was going to put these bushes, and I borrowed one of those um, rototillers with the huge tines, and I spent a long time just grinding it in, grinding it in, tilling the soil, grinding it. So I planted those bushes, and she was right. Like rockets. These things were like, tush, they took off. <laughs> My neighbors were like, what did you plant? How did you, how'd you do that? And I was like, add the green thumb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Jesus is saying the same thing. If you are going to have that kind of production where something is going to shoot forth from the logos, it has to be found in good soil good soil. And so as I was studying this week, you know, Jesus spends a lot of time about the path, the rocky soil, the competition. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking about good soil. And so that really, it takes us to really, in a, in a parable way, to start thinking on our own. What does it mean to be fostering good soil in our lives? Being open to, as we see, hear the word. And I think there's something right in front of us that uh, is also very important. And if you're someone who likes to mark in your Bible, this is a good time to do that. Because you see, every time in the four soils, we've heard the word to hear the word, hear the word, hear the word. But in this fourth time, it also in the English says, hear the word. But a better translation is really hearing the word. Hearing. You see, the first three, it really is a tense where it speaks of something you've heard in the past. Yes, I hear the word. It, it speaks of something that you did a while ago and you have heard it. But in verse 20, the word is much different in its tense to speak of hearing. Continually hearing, allowing it to penetrate, welcoming its presence into your life. Not something you did in 1983, but something you do continually allowing the word, the logos, to penetrate your heart. It speaks of being in God's word, his written word, 
to allow it to, to seep into our lives and to find whatever kind of devotional or book that helps us to whatever it takes to allow the logos to seep into our lives. It also means a relationship with Jesus Christ, the, the logos, developing that relationship, not just something I did, oh, I did that back at camp a number of years ago, but a relationship that is ongoing, one where you talk to him and you pray and you are just developing and so I think the key to good soil is being active in our hearing. And that's why Jesus says at the beginning and at the end, at kind of as bookends, as he speaks about the parable, he says, hear what I'm saying. All you who hear this, listen, hear, listen, be listening. And if he were right here, he would say the same thing to us. He would say, Riverwood Community Chapel, be listening for the word. Listen to it. It's about having a life that is moldable, a life that our hearts are soft, and we allow the seeds to come and, and to plant into our lives. And it's not easy sometimes, because sometimes the logos comes in, and it's not something that we want to hear. If it was, then we'd be more akin to the, the rocky soil easy things, easy gospel. No, at times it's very difficult. The things he wants us to do and how he wants us to reach out to our community and love our enemies and care for our children and wives. How, how do we do it all? It's very difficult when the logos starts going into the soil of your heart and planting there and giving it time to grow giving it time to hear nutrient, to have nutrients to grow and expand so that it is something, that look at the outcome, that is something that is bearing fruit. And I think about the tree in my backyard that is so tall and strong. It's bearing more seed, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. The logos is planted and able to grow into something it is beautiful. This is what Jesus would say through this parable. And as we get to our time here at the end, it, it asks us very personal questions. And the question we keep coming back to is, how is the soil of your heart? What do you most resonate with when you hear Jesus speak about the soil types? And in a room this size, I'm guessing there are some here where the seed comes and it's very hard place and it's like, I don't need that. Beware. Beware. The enemy loves to have that, to come and to take that. Some here are very, they resonate with this idea of being rocky and it's easy at times and that's all you really want are the easy moments and beware. For when the sun comes, it will scorch. But my feeling is that there are many in this room who really resonate with that third type, where there's lots of com com competitors in the garden. We like the word, and we like the logos. We like to give it some life and have it grow in our garden. But we also like a lot of other things, too. And it's, it's okay, and... Uh, Pulling out that weed is really hard and difficult, and we'll just leave it there, and we'll see how things go. And Jesus would say, beware. The logos could very easily be choked out by the things of this world. Our call is to be people who are developing good soil. Hard work takes time. It takes tilling allowing our hearts to be open to what God is saying, the Logos. My hope and prayer is that you figure it out for your life. See, I know what I need to pull out in my life. You need to figure that out for yours so we can allow God's word. Oh, my goodness, think about this. Allowing his word to be planted in the, the lives of the people here, a room filled with 200 people, allowing the word to grow and to blossom and multiply— that's exciting. It's exciting. 
but it takes a lot of hard work allowing the word to plant deep into our lives. If you want to talk more about it afterwards, I'd love to. If you have questions or something doesn't sit quite right with you, I'd love to spend some time talking with you. Let's pray together. Dear God, we come before you and we submit ourselves to the Logos, to your word and to you and to your son. We thank you so much for its truth. At times we welcome it and with joy, but there are other times it's very difficult to hear what the Logos is saying to us. And so I pray that you would speak to each one of us this morning to be honest with the soil type of our heart. Where are we? Impress your truths upon us. Allow us to be transformed and changed because we want so desperately to be the plant that is 30 and 60, 100 fold producing something that is good for the kingdom of God. Plant your word deep into our hearts. This is our simple prayer this morning. May we be obedient to that call. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.